Welcome to El Ben's Tea House, good evening, friends. Thank you for visiting, I'm your host El Ben. Yesterday, we were discussing how Christmas has become so popular in China. The reason, we figured, is that Christmas offers young people a rare opportunity to spend time not with family, but with friends, exchanging gifts. It's a day to gather, eat, sing, and because of this demand, the market supplies, making it a widely celebrated occasion. But heed my words, if you're partying late into the night, do bear some restraint. Don't drink too much and get home early. I was planning to go big on the festivities today, perhaps even take a day off from broadcasting to enjoy myself. But when I mentioned it in the group, some accused me of not taking things seriously and others, considering my age, advised me against wandering out. Then, a listener sent me a private message, short but unsettling, on Christmas Eve, better not to go out. It's not safe. Odd, isn't it? Isn't everyone out having a blast these days? But this listener told me a hair-raising Christmas tale. Our listener, Xiao Lu, a talented young lady and an exceptional graduate from an engineering university, now works in Shanghai. Last winter, as she was about to graduate, her class was frantically job hunting. As luck would have it, Xiao Lu and her close friends got early offers from their desired firms, so the period leading up to graduation was free of worries, and the job contracts were signed. They were overjoyed, especially with Christmas around the corner. The entire class decided to celebrate with a dinner followed by an all-night KTV session, marking the imminent end of their college life. They reminisced about the bonds formed over the years and the approaching divergence of paths. That evening, that closery led to excessive drinking. It said, while there's wine, one might as well be drunk for the more one drinks, the greater the sorrow. So, those who hadn't landed jobs or secured postgraduate placements were even more inebriated. But Xiao Lu's class had no such worries, they sang heartily with drinks in hand. As the night progressed, the company dwindled from 30 to a mere dozen. By 1.30 a.m., some began to leave, some proceeding to their homes and others to hotels, always with the sober helping the drunken. Xiao Lu and her roommates, Worm and Dongxue, had different fates awaiting them after graduation. Worm secured a research position through the university. Dong Xue passed the civil service exam in her boyfriend's hometown, Chengdu. So despite the cold northern nights, their spirits were as warm as spring memories. They laughed at their peers for succumbing so soon and lamented the party breaking up early, questioning if one could call it a college life without experiencing an all-night KTV session. Standing by the roadside, the three of them wondered why the night had to end so soon considering the holidays were approaching and school would be inconsequential after the break. They hadn't had their fill, they wanted more from the night, such a precious opportunity. Who will we go crazy with if we want to party like this again? Chang Chang reiterated, Dong Xue, you're going to work in Chengdu, can you handle their spicy food? Xiao Yu boasted he could whip up a spicy hot pot himself. Dong Xue laughed it off saying spicy food is nothing but it's the mahjong obsession of her boyfriend's family in Sichuan that baffles her. Right, I've heard even floods can't stop them, they'd play in the water, acknowledged Xiaoyu. The trio decided to practice mahjong, reinforcing the adage that birds of a feather flock together. Friends with similar interests would gather for League of Legends or, in their case, mahjong. They often played mahjong together sometimes in the dorm, sometimes with classmates, and occasionally in mahjong parlors. It was already 1.30 a.m., far too late to find a normal parlor. As they walked and chatted, they considered playing online but dismissed the idea, finding no joy in winning virtual coins. That's when they saw an old signboard lit up in the distance, Tungfei Senior Activity Center. A mahjong parlor open at this hour? They were intrigued. Upon closer inspection, my goodness, the 200 square meter space was ablaze with light. Normal mahjong parlors were small, divided into booths with maybe 10 tables. But this place looked like it could fit a hundred tables. Even the trio, who had seen the grand bazaars of mahjong carpets, were stunned by its size. It felt like they'd walked into a gambling den, not a senior center. They'd wondered if they had stumbled upon Macau. Inside, there wasn't a free table. The air was thick with smoke and clamor. The noise from tile shuffling, money changing, and cursing melded into a symphony of life. Many were smoking, the haze was so dense the other end of the room was invisible. One could hardly tell if the open door was for ventilation or effect. The room wasn't particularly warm, but it was tolerable. Taken aback yet fascinated, they'd never seen such a place. A staff member, perhaps the owner, emerged from the crowd. 
Learning that the hall was full, they were offered a private room for 10 yuan per table game, a bargain. I may not play, but I've studied mahjong. It has a broad base in China, almost synonymous with the presence of Chinese communities. It doubles as entertainment and gambling, and the law classifies it as gambling when money is bet. But let's be reasonable. There are countless ways to gamble one's fortunes away. Cultural acceptance is growing with societal progress. Practices that were once reprimanded or criminalized are now normalized, reflecting a more tolerant view of various social phenomena. As enforcement relaxes, mahjong parlors sprout like bamboo shoots after rain, now thinly veiled as senior activity centers. Community centers were later gradually referred to as card rooms, and now, boldly labeled as mahjong parlors. However, these establishments still operate in a legal gray area, a sort of shadow industry. Different places charge in different ways. Smaller parlors with only a few tables usually have a regular clientele from nearby, playing three sessions a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one from evening till midnight. Thus, these small parlors charge 20 or 40 yuan per session. Winners pay. If there are no wins or losses, or the players are strangers to each other, everyone pays their share. Larger, more formal parlors, due to the continuous influx of people and those who leave abruptly after a couple of games, can't charge per session and instead opt for an hourly rate. This could be per table or per person, which is a bit costlier. Upon hearing it's only 10 yuan a session, regardless if it's per lift of the hand or per person, the trio considered it to be a steal. But there was an issue, there were only three of them. They asked if it would be possible to find a fourth player. The server reassured them that there were always people inside looking to join a game, pointing to the east wall where players eagerly waited. Entering a small room, they were struck by its decor, it was reminiscent of the Republic of China era. A black wall clock, housed in carved wood and covered with glass, marked the hour and half hour with a chime, emphasizing its theme. Inside, a man sat waiting eagerly as the girls entered, rubbing his hands in glee, whispering rapidly about the arrival of new players. A card game with three women and one man is known as San Niang teaching her son, a surefire way for the man to lose money. Although not supported by vast data, my analysis holds that in San Niang teaching her son, the man has at least a 50% chance of losing. This is mainly because men often consider women as a weaker group in mahjong, not as skilled and thus struggle with the impulse to be too competitive. However, girls play mahjong like they drink, either they don't know how or they play ruthlessly. Ladies are meticulous and calculative, and when three women chatter, it can disrupt one's thoughts. Add to that the potential distraction if the women are pretty, and the man is at an even greater disadvantage. But this evening, Xiaoyu, Changchang, and Dongxue had abandoned their serial cannons. No matter what they aimed for, they kept hitting electric cannons, watching their few hundred yuan dwindle. Moreover, they began feeling increasingly hot despite the open door. Shedding their outerwear and loosening their garments did not alleviate the heat. Calling for the owner, they ordered drinks but spat them out. The iced tea lacked any trace of its usual tangy sweetness, and it left an uncomfortable feeling in their throats. Ignoring this, they continued to play cards, growing hotter, drinking more water, which only added to their discomfort. It was amid this discomfort that they felt a sense of relief when the clock struck four times. In the middle of the game, the man shivered, drew the winning tile, and declared victory. Standing abruptly, he insisted on leaving right away for home, urging, quick, give me the money. The others protested, what's this about money? You win and run away? Where to from here? Let's play for a bit longer, harden up with that saying, fear eating if you win, fear breaking up if you lose. Those who win money want to leave quickly, even when I win a little, I'm expected to treat everyone or play until it's enough. Those who lose want to recover their losses and are reluctant to disband. But this man was not to be deterred, he insisted on being paid quickly so he could return home. Xiaoyu and Worm, being honest, handed over the money promptly as the man seemed in a rush. But Dongxue couldn't accept this, having always lived comfortably, she was accustomed to getting her way with boyfriends and at school. She couldn't believe she would lose like this and let the man leave without a fuss. But alas, without cash on hand, she was left in shock as the man swiped the money from the table with a swipe, declaring, if you don't pay debts, my win means nothing. Pay back what you owe before demanding your bells and whistles, and he left promptly after his piece. The three girls were left puzzled, questioning the man's abrupt departure and muttering, is he mad? But losing money does hurt. 
They called the server, asking for another player, but the server looked astonished and advised, please stop playing, girls, it's time to close, close? Just like that, protested Xiaoyu, having lost several hundred yuan. Is everyone outside just a bluff? She pondered aloud as they observed the silent, empty hall, which was brightly lit just moments before, now dark as night. The grand doors that once stood wide open were now slowly closing before their eyes. Xiaoyu felt a chill and discomfort in her stomach, a premonition that once the doors closed, they would be trapped inside. Dropping a 10 yuan table fee and deciding not to dress properly in their haste, they made an escape worthy of a life or death chase and bolted out of the mahjong parlor. As they stepped out, they heard the grand doors clash shut behind them in the silent corridor. Stumbling back to the dorm, the girls, without even unlocking the door, managed to break in and immediately fell asleep, exhaustion overtaking them. Waking up the next morning felt like they had slept for a whole day and night, all three catching a cold. Upon waking, they discovered their hands covered in dirt, their speech hampered. They couldn't tell if it was a sore throat or something else, but there was a foul taste in their mouths. That's when the recollection dawned on them, what place had they been to the previous night? They mused that the smoke didn't seem quite right, not typical of cigarette smoke, indeed, it smelled more like burning paper, a scent unfamiliar to them. The more they contemplated, the more frightened they became. Tracing their steps back, they couldn't find the expansive mahjong parlor near the KTV, only a garbage dump with a dozen large bins emitting a foul stench. A sanitation worker approached them, and Xiaoyu asked, Ma'am, is there a big mahjong parlor around here? The old lady pointed to the wall by the trash bins and said, It's been closed for years, see? Doors sealed up by piled rubbish. The old owner once got drunk, his friends left him at his doorstep, but he never made it inside, fell asleep outside. The next morning, he was found frozen stiff, naked. The place has been empty since, and it's strange, people always ask if the mahjong parlor is still open. Following the old lady's gesture, they saw a dilapidated sign, half concealed by the trash bins. Although only a few words were still visible, Tungfei Senior Activity Center was clear. What happened last night? The doors were wide open, we were drinking and playing cards. Chang Chang remembered having changed from buying beverages last night and reached into his pocket, finding what? Mixed with the change was a Joss paper bill. The recollection of the drinks consumed last night and the sight of the messy water bottles on the ground left a churning feeling in their stomachs. Just then, Xiao Lu's phone rang. It was the class monitor, inviting them to a carnival tonight. Let's continue the fun, a grand class gathering. We'll start with dinner, followed by singing. After that, Zhang Bo has arranged a massive mahjong parlor for us to battle it out until dawn. Inform your dorm mates, will you? No one's allowed to bail tonight, who runs as a grandson, the monitor said firmly before hanging up. None of the three friends had any enthusiasm for that day's gathering. They were truly under the weather after that night, leading to a dazed winter vacation and a confused start to work. They had escaped unscathed, physically at least, until a few days ago. Dong Shui, now a civil servant in Chengdu, called, saying she was at work, bored, and succumbed to playing computer games. But she was caught by the disciplinary inspection team on a surprise visit. And now her job was at risk. Xiaoyu suddenly remembered Dong Shui's contentious final round of Mahjong and the leaving player's words. If you don't pay, I win for nothing. I'll take the money, or I'll consider you having to make up to me. Well, sisters, that's the story for tonight, Christmas Eve. Have you made it home safely? Just a little tale, don't take it too seriously. In the Northeast, we often hear about people who drank too much and then froze to death on the streets overnight. These incidents always seem to spark bizarre discoveries. The deceased is always found without clothes, which raises questions. Many families suspect foul play, arguing that sleeping outside fully clothed wouldn't cause harm. Intoxicated people lying in the frigid outdoors will eventually succumb to hypothermia regardless of their attire. The sense of feeling hot due to poor blood circulation to the organs might lead to the disrobing commonly found in such victims, a phenomenon scientifically termed, paradoxical undressing. I'm better at narratives that leave the audience deep in thought. If anything, today's story serves as a warning for the youth to head home early in the evenings.